Welcome to CSIS. Thank you all for coming out. Um, with the APEC meetings in full swing, this seemed like a good opportunity to uh, have a perhaps not quite traditional conversation around uh, economic and security issues in Asia. Um, but um, in doing that, I think we wanted to bring in the perspectives um, that don't always get um, talked about so much when we think about Asian uh, security and multilateral cooperation. Um, we have a lot of people, including here at CSIS, who focus on Asia, um, and we have a lot of people who focus on Europe, European security, Russia, the United States. Um, but one of the challenges that I found is that we don't always talk to each other um, as much as we should. Uh, and we don't always understand uh, the issues that uh, one another are focusing on as well as we should. So with the APEC meetings happening, with Donald Trump meeting with Xi Jinping and maybe with Vladimir Putin um, during these meetings, uh, it seemed like a good time to have a conversation with some leading experts uh, in town and not only from in town uh, to talk about U.S., Russian, and Chinese perspectives on uh, a whole range of issues across Asia. Um, and we decided to frame this conversation around uh, grand strategy. How is it that the three countries, U.S., Russia, and China, think about Asia? How does it fit into their overall strategic perspectives? How does it affect their relations with one another? Um, and in order to do that, we have um, a terrific panel bringing in people from um, a variety of locations, institutions, uh, and perspectives. Um, to my left, we have Anna Kireyeva, who is an associate professor uh, in the Department of Asian and African Studies at the Moscow City Institute for International Relations. Um, to her left, we have uh, Yoon Soon, who um, is, um, oops, uh, missing part of her biography, apparently, um, who is at the, the Stimson Center uh, and is an expert on China, um, both economic and uh, security issues. And then uh, to my far left, uh, and that's only a locational perspective, that's not a political comment, um, is Bonnie Glazer, who is our senior advisor uh, for Asia here at CSIS and the director of uh, the CSIS China Power Project, which she works on uh, a whole range of issues related to China and Chinese foreign policy and um, Asia Pacific security. Um, we are going to try and have a, an open discussion here. So um, I think we're going to have um, each of the panelists give uh, fairly short opening remarks, and then we'll open it up um, for discussion. Um, I guess if you all are okay with it, we'll just go in this order here down the, the table. Um, and I would sort of kick it off by asking each of you to talk a little bit about how Asia fits into the overall grand strategic perspective of, of the countries you're uh, covering and what that country's um, involvement in Asia means for regional development and security. And what do they mean by Asia? Or do, we, do they have the same understanding of, of Asia when they use the term? So that should be plenty to sort of kick off the discussion and then um, we will open it up. So without further ado, uh, let me pass the floor to uh, Professor Kireyeva. Um, thank you so much. This is a great honor for me to be here uh, and uh, present what uh, could be Russia's perspective on this issue. Um, so uh, if we look at what Russia, um, how Russia sees Asia, um, the first thing I should say is that uh, Asia has been very high on Russia's uh, strategic uh, calculations and probably um, we can say that Russia has a, uh, that Asia has emerged as one of the major strategic dimensions of foreign policy for, for Russia. Um, of course, uh, we should say that it's not um, it's not recent uh, development. It has been the focus of uh, Russia for uh, quite a long time, uh, and uh, probably this policy was launched in the beginning of the 21st century. Um, when um, the growing understanding that it is Asia uh, where the gravity of world economics and world politics is shifting to, that Russia should also try to uh, cooperate more and engage more with. Um, 
And of course, as Russia perceives itself as a great power, its positions should be strong in all the regions it geographically belongs to. And of course, if we compare Russia's standing in Europe in the post-Soviet space, uh, East Asia is the region where Russia has uh, much weaker standings that are to be improved in a number of spheres in politics, security, and of course, first and foremost, in economics. Uh, and. Um, mm, the policy, which is in Russia called turn to the east, or Russia's Asian pivot, if you like more this expression, I don't know. Um, it is kind of a strategic uh, policy for Russia, uh, with a vision that it wants to be more engaged and better engaged uh, with this actively developing region. Um, as I said, it started probably just not two, three years ago. It started much earlier, and we can see its roots even in the late USSR era, of course. Uh, uh, but what really accelerated Russia's Asian period was the uh, worsening of relations with Europe and the US, uh, the rift with the West, which uh, made Russia accelerate more and to look for partners, especially to China, its major strategic partner in Asia, uh, just to have a kind of a safeguard against the damage dealt to the Russian economy by the Western sanctions. Um, so w w Russia actually is... Um, wants to see itself as a stakeholder in East Asia and in Asia in general. And if we look at how Russia defines Asia, uh, we can say that uh, it is mostly East Asia that Russia is focusing on, but uh, it is also um, part of South Asia that um, is a great importance to Russia, especially if we take into, considerations, into consideration that it is China, India and Vietnam, one of the major Russian strategic partners uh, in these regions. Um, so um, actually when we talk about Russia's Asian period, we should consider it uh, being mostly a period to East Asia, but also considering a role of India uh, as one of the major strategic partners of Russia as well. Um, so uh, actually what's Russian uh, vision of its interests towards Asia uh, is that Russia wants to strengthen its positions as one of the regional uh, powers, as one of the major powers uh, in Asia, and well, possibly as a full-fledged regional power uh, with uh, strong positions. Um, and this task is now understood as extremely important because of the urgent need of the development of Russia's Far East. Uh, as you, of course, very well know, uh, it is a great territory, but with only six million people living there. And, uh, well, uh, it, it, it's not a good thing for Russia that the uh, part which is in Asia, the most developing region, that uh, the, the most fastly developing region that Russia is trying to pivot to, is its backward province. So uh, there have been attempts to um, develop this region. And what we have really seen uh, since 2012 uh, are the attempts to reform regional governance structure in the Far East, uh, introducing the Ministry for the Development of the Far East and then uh, special territories, advanced special economic zones, and Vladivostok as a free port, uh, and trying to attract foreign investment, Chinese, Japanese, South Koreans investment, and investment from ASEAN, India, and other states, because Russia understands it cannot develop this territory alone, and it has been declared as the priority of, of uh, Russia's policy for the whole 21st century. So I think this is one of the major urgent tasks. Uh, Russia has also got a view of a polycentric order in Asia, and um, Russia believes that it should strengthen its positions as an independent pole, as an independent power uh, in this East Asian strategic calculations, and um, it um, also looks for regional security, uh, because it really does need security, especially on the Korean Peninsula, uh, in order to promote the development of the Far East. So um, that's why Russia has no revisionist agenda in East Asia, and it is uh, extremely interested in, st in maintaining stability, maintaining uh, what can be called a status quo. Uh, and um, at of course, first and foremost, it's not interested in any military actions on the Korean Peninsula. That's why its policy there has been promoting um, 
uh, promoting negotiations and political dialogue as the major means to uh, settle the um, issue uh, of the Korean Peninsula and first foremost to deal with uh, North Korean nuclear and missile program. Um, so um, it, probably what is very important for Russia, uh, the most important part of its Asian strategy has been relations with China, of course. And Russia views relations with strate its strategic partnership with China as the major centerpiece of its Asian policy. Um, it is based on a, a number of perceptions that uh, Russia and China share together, uh, and probably the most important is a view to the uh, multipolar or a polycentric world order, uh, which would not entail uh, dominance or preeminence of any particular one power, but would have different centers of power, and it fits into Russia's uh, independent role and its role it sees for itself in East Asia. Um, it's also a respect for mutual sovereignty, non-interference into domestic affairs, um, and a lot of other issues, for example, uh, the, um, the policy on the uh, Korean Peninsula that Russia and China have a lot in common. Not all, but, well, uh, quite a lot, if we could see. Uh, however, um, as, as I said previously, Russia wants to see itself as also kind of uh, as, as, as centers of power in East Asia, an independent one. Uh, that's why it's also trying to uh, kind of hedge uh, and to uh, avoid too much dependence on China specifically, uh, and develop relations with other states in order to have a more balanced, more uh, um, diversified policy. So uh, with this aim, Russia is developing relations with trying to uh, foster partnerships with Japan, South Korea in the first place, and also we could see their relations with ASEAN, relations with India, uh, and a number of other partners. Um, you may say that Russia's Asian pivot has not been too much successful, uh, and you would be right about uh, just uh, saying about this. Uh, we can see that a kind of strategic policy, um, there, it has been very slow, it is incomplete, uh, like a major policy for, for, for Russia, um, and it actually needs to be strengthened, uh, especially uh, the major problem is the development, the model of economic development, uh, and also the model of economic development in the Far East. However, if we look at the progress that Russia has had, we can see that, for example, trade turnover of Russia and East Asia since the year 2000 and 2012 has multiple uh, has multiplied more than tenfold. So there has been 10 times increase in uh, trade. And we can, uh, what is also important, we can see the increase of share of Asia uh, in uh, Russia's trade. And uh, now, uh, for example, APIC countries account for 31% of Russia's trade. And there has been a great increase in 10 uh, or in 50 years in this figure. Um, and um, also, uh, Russia, one of the major concerns of Russia uh, is, the, uh, first and foremost, the tensions that we are now witnessing in Asia. Uh, and here, of course, Russia opposes for uh, the actions which can bring about military hostilities. And it sees um, that uh, not only uh, the North Korean actions, but also the US actions uh, bring about instability in the region. Uh, and it also is very negative towards thought deployment in South Korea and opposes it as a kind of strategic game changer that uh, uh, that only destabilizes the regional situation, that tries to, um, uh, to, um, um, uh, to, to make for security of one country at the expense of other countries, and not helping the situation in general as a means. Um, so um, probably I would stop here now, right? Okay. Great. Um, and now, uh, Yun Sun, we can talk about China. Thank you, Jeff. And thank you so much, Bonnie, for having me here. Bonnie is my great senpai and my mentor in terms of my studies, so it's truly an honor to be on the same panel with you. Thank you. Um, I was asked to talk about China's Asia policy. Um, 
so I'll, I'll divide my, my talk into several parts. So first of all, there's, you might be aware that um, before Xi Jinping came into power, there had been this consistent debate in the Chinese foreign policy apparatus about which one should be the top priority for Chinese diplomacy, for Chinese foreign policy. Should it be the great power relations, aka US-China relations, or it should be China's relationship with, with its neighbors, with its periphery. So those who believe that um, US-China relations is, is more important emphasize that as long as that um, US-China relationship was stable, then the countries in China's neighborhood would, no long, would not have the opportunity to exploit the conflicts and the differences between US and China to, to maximize their own national interests. So the assumption or the argument for this camp is that as long as US-China relationship is good, um, China's relationship with its periphery will automatically and naturally be stable. And the, the, the other argument, the, the other camp who emphasized the periphery relations um, argue that the emphasis on US-China relationship is, uh, is, is reversing the logic of a good external relationship for China because the logic of the United States in this argument is to exploit the problems or the concerns and suspicions of China's neighbors about China to undermine China's external, external relations and the external environment. Therefore, the logic goes that China's prior, priority should be the pursuit of a good relationship with its neighbors in its periphery in order to shape a stable foundation for uh, US-China relations. So this debate has had been going on for quite a few years, especially under, under Hu Jintao um, decade. And this debate was more or less had an initial settlement by the time uh, that Xi Jinping, Xi Jinping held the periphery diplomacy working conference before the end of 2013. And the emphasis that Xi Jinping has placed on the uh, periphery and foreign policy towards China's periphery is believed and interpreted as an indicator of China beginning to see the periphery as more important than, uh, than, than the United States. And then, of course, we know that six months later, um, SICA was held in, uh, in, in Shanghai in May of 2014. And at the SICA, China raised the idea that uh, Asian affairs should be managed primarily by Asian countries. And that is interpreted as a Chinese version of the Monroe Doctrine, in, Monroe Doctrine in Asia, and indicated in a lot of analysis a, um, a policy orientation by China to exclude a dominant role by the United States in Asia. It's interesting that when we talk about Asia policy in the Chinese foreign policy, Asia policy is not a categorical concept for China's foreign policy. If you look at the periphery, China's periphery, that's a very important concept. But if you look at China's policy towards Asia, most of the time people talk about specific sub-regions in Asia. So there is a policy towards Northeast Asia, there is a policy towards Southeast Asia, and there is a policy towards South Asia, and there is even uh, also a policy towards Central Asia, although that's closely related to the policy uh, on, on Russia. But then West Asia is more um, categorized under the um, scope of Middle East, so MENA in, uh, in China. And in different sub-regions in Asia, China also has different interests and different policies. For example, in Northeast Asia, China's primary focus is on the development in the Korean Peninsula and also the evolution of the US military alliance in Northeast Asia. In Southeast Asia, China's focus has been on how to manage and control the South China Sea um, issues and the disturbance it has created for China's relationship with Southeast Asian countries. In South Asia, China's focus and priority is how to, managing, how to manage this conflict agendas with India. So on one hand, China has to balance its competition with India in terms of the regional competition in South Asia. But on the other hand, on the global level, China pursues a, a coalition 
with uh, with India, both as emerging markets, rising powers, members of the BRICS, in order to counter the pressure from the developed countries on on, on the uh, on the develop developed countries on developing country bloc. Then in Central Asia, China's priority is to maintain the openness of the Central Asian region and to ensure that China has a fair role and a fair chance to participate in, in, in the future of Central Asia. On the issue of Afghanistan, Pakistan, China's priority is counterterrorism, stabilization, and the prevention of the spillover effect of the internal instability in these two countries. So there are different pursuits and different priorities. But if we want to generalize what are some of the common themes or common interests coming to China's overall policy towards Asia, there are a couple. I would, I would say there are at least three. The first one is, of course, the maintenance of the peace and stability in China's periphery region. Uh, there can be no war and there can be no chaos. The second uh, interest across Asia is uh, the pursuit, China's pursuit of regional economic cooperation to expedite the infrastructure development and the connectivity projects in, uh, in Asia, especially under the Belt and Road Initiative. And the third category of um, um, general interest in Asia is how to use economic statecraft and use China's diplomacy, public diplomacy and soft power to mitigate the rejection by Asian countries about China's rise and about China's rising leadership role in, in Asia. So if you ask ex outside observers, not Chinese observers, most of uh, the analysts would, would draw the conclusion that China is trying to build a dominant role in Asia, maybe not politically or security-wise at the current stage, but China is using its economic power using its soft power influence to strengthen and to expand its influence leading up to such a dominant role. And such a China-centric dominance does not exclude the United States or US role in Asia, but it will have a, a strong component or connotation of rejection of a leadership role by the United States in Asia. Last but not least, the China's view about Russia's Asia policy. We know that China and Russia has formed this strategic coordinate, uh, coordinative, <laughs> so very long term, coordinative partnership with, with Russia. And the logic for that is that the U.S. has been increasing its strategic pressure on Russia in terms of the NATO expansion, in terms of the missile, deploy, missile defense system in East Europe. And in terms of the uh, West Pacific, the rebalancing to Asia also increased the uh, strategic pressure on China. So there's a, there's a logic, there's a common interest where China and Russia see that, well, we, we should align our positions to, to at least to counter some of the strategic pressure from the United States. But so that is that is true, and we 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 can have a long list of indicators of how this strategic coordination between China and Russia has borne fruit, and how you uh, China and Russia has have pursued coordination and cooperation on a long list of uh, strategic and security issues. However, but if you if you look at the issues that have, between U.S. between China and Russia that has nothing to do with the United States then that's where you see more problems and more difference of opinions. So for example, China's Belt and Road, when this idea was first raised in 2012, 2013, one common criticism, even in China, was that, wait, you do realize that Central Asia is Russia's traditional sphere of influence, right? And for us to expand our economic influence will inevitably put us in a, in a collision course with Russia's strategic influence. So that's one area of, uh, of conflict. And the other issue, the other conflict that we don't hear China or Russia talk too much about is that, uh, like Anna mentioned, Russia has been seeking this diversification of relations in, in this Asia policy, which makes perfect sense for Russia. But on the other hand, when Russia enhances arms sales to India and to Vietnam, both countries have territorial disputes with China and problems with China. And those arms sales make China uncomfortable enough. Um, of course, overall, the weakening of Russia's national, uh, comprehensive national power and the international isolation has put China, I would say, at a disad disadvantaged position in its, uh, in its bargaining and uh, negotiation with China. And uh, one common notion that you hear about the Belt and Road Initiative is China and Russia have been seeking 
areas of cooperation or how to connect the Belt and Road Initiative with the Russia-dominated Eurasia Economic Union. So you hear a lot of rhetoric in that in that direction, but I haven't seen too many uh, too many concrete examples of, uh, of of success. And last but not least, on the issue of DPRK, there is also this interesting uh, interesting. Um, differences or there's some differences between the Chinese position and the Russian position. Like the Chinese would say that, why is US putting all the pressure on us while Russia is also providing aid and trade with North Korea? And it raises questions in China as for the Russia's strategic intention. Is Russia trying to increase its leverage vis-a-vis -vis the United States? Or there's something more to it? So there are certain level of strategic coordination on the Korean Peninsula between China and Russia, although there are also issues of uh, disagreements. Last but not least, China's view of US policy towards Asia, no surprise, uh, there has been a lot of suspicion and hostility, especially under the Obama administration. And under the Trump administration with the suspension of TPP by the United States and with US pursuing a more pragmatic and transactional relationship, um, I think the Chinese view of of U.S. policy towards Russia, uh, towards Asia has been improving, and there have been um, discussions, a lot of discussions about the possible cooperation on North Korea on Belt and Road. There are even voices circulating in China about whether G2 between U.S. and China in the Asia Pacific may not be a bad idea, right? Um, so those are the discussions. But in the long in the long run, I would say that the Chinese suspicion still lies in the fact that whether Trump's Asia policy will represent the long-term trajectory of the U.S. policy in Asia, such as uh, the, the, the notion of Indo-Pacific has, um, has, has raised a lot of sensitive nerves in, uh, in, in, in China about what is the next step of, of U.S.-Asia policy. And I would say that in the Chinese calculation, if a competitive relationship with the United States is, is fixed for the long run, then the Chinese logic or the logical conclusion would be let's uh, maximize our gains and maximize our interest and pursue cooperation with Trump administration while we can. But in the long run, we need to also preserve our leverage. That is our po well, that is China's policy. And I don't speak for Chinese government. So. <laughs> yes, thank you for the caveat. We're all speaking in our personal capacity here. Um, Bonnie, you want to cover the US? Thank you, Jeff, um, and I certainly represent nobody's views but my own. Uh, but I've been asked to talk about uh, U.S. interests in, in uh, Asia and how the United States sees the role of uh, Russia and, uh, and China. And we are seeing um, the Trump administration's policy evolve. Uh, uh, Yun just talked about the Indo-Pacific. We will hear President Trump give a speech very soon uh, at APEC uh, uh, that I, I understand will present a vision uh, of the Trump administration for the Indo-Pacific. This is not a new phrase, uh, of course. We've heard many countries use this before, Australia, Japan, um, our own Pacific Command, its area of operations is, in fact, um, um, it, it, it extends to India. Uh, but for, um, for the Trump administration, this seems to be uh, the way that it is thinking about its strategy towards the whole region, China being a part of that, uh, but encompassing Northeast Asia, Southeast Asia, um, the South Pacific, and as people say, extending from Bollywood to Hollywood, um, and uh, not my phrase. Uh, somebody in Australia wrote a report with that, um, uh, that title, um, and Japan has talked about this as the great diamond, and so you have Japan in the north, and you have uh, Australia, New Zealand, uh, Pacific Islands uh, in the south. Um, and Asia is sort of a subset of this. And uh, you will hear even Americans, when they talk about Asia, they don't necessarily have the same countries in mind. Some people might really not focus on Central Asia. Um, others might just, you know, focus on, on East Asia and not think about India. Uh, so there's really, I think, no consensus on that. But what's the point I'd like to make here is that the United States has enduring interests in the region, and I think what you're going to hear from President Trump will be really quite consistent with what you heard from the Obama administration, from even uh, the Bush administration, and maybe even to some extent the Clinton administration before it. 
um, the United States, um, particularly under the Obama administration, articulated very clearly interests in Asia. 2010, Hillary Clinton gave that famous speech uh, in Hanoi where she talked about U.S. interests, particularly in the South China Sea, but they really extended more broadly. And so obviously we talk about things like um, economic prosperity. You know, the United States um, has always emphasized uh, the, the, whether you call it Asia, Asia Pacific or Indo-Pacific, as being critically important to America's economic prosperity. Indeed, this is the reason why uh, American ships started coming uh, to the region um, you know, in the 18th century. And I think you will hear President Trump also talk about uh, the first ships from the United States that went to uh, trade with Asia. Uh, so having open access, commercial, free commercial navigation, um, has always been important to the United States. So this administration might use the term free and open Pacific, uh, but or Indo-Pacific, but these are not new concepts uh, for the United States. Uh, we have also heard some officials, I think when Secretary Tillerson was here, I think he talked about a rules-based order, uh, uh, the concept, of course, of peaceful resolution of disputes based on international law, these are all uh, things that we have heard previously. Um, the United States, I think, overall has an overarching strategic interest in preventing any single power from gaining hegemony over this entire region. Um, and some people say that the United States insists on securing its own supremacy. Um, uh, that is not really clear going forward, whether you then the United States is willing to share um, uh, both responsibilities, obligations, um, and uh, uh, it's uh, the free and open sea lane, certainly with other uh, countries, uh, but whether or not it insists at being at the top of that, the apex of this order in the region, or is willing to have sort of a more, be part of more of um, what Anna referred to as sort of a poly um, national or something multi, but polycentric uh, 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 order in the region. Uh, I think the one thing we're hearing from the Trump administration that is new is really in the economic side. And so there's discussion of fair and reciprocal trade. This is very different than the free trade language that was used by the uh, Obama administration. There, is, has, there has been obviously a withdrawal from the TPP. President Trump is going to call for countries uh, to negotiate free trade agreements with the United States bilaterally. Um, and it remains to be seen which countries are going to be interested um, in doing that. So you're not going to hear language like principled security network, which we heard from the previous administration. It's not fundamentally uh, different. So I would say American interests in this region are really enduring. Next, I'll turn to uh, the view of Russia's involvement in Asia. And I think the first point to be made is that the United States doesn't really see Russia as a really major actor in this region. Um, certainly, Russia has interests. The United States has worked with Russia, for example, as part of the six-party talks. Uh, we, in the past, have had negotiations with Russia as a partner in the six-party talks. Obviously, we haven't had a, a, session of the six party talks in a long time. So that's pretty much in uh, abeyance. Um, uh, maybe we talk about this issue occasionally, but it has fallen, I think, pretty low on our priorities in dealing with Russia because we have so many other problems. And the U.S.-Russia relationship is now so caught up in our own domestic politics um, and the question of Russian interference in our elections that um, uh, I think it's going to be very difficult for the United States to in any way work with, uh, with Russia um, in Asia or elsewhere. I really want to talk about the North Korea issue, though, because it's been alluded to that uh, the United States sees Russia as very unhelpful in Asia. We may shine the spotlight on China's behavior, but the reality is that the United States sees Russia as backfilling for in areas like energy, other illicit goods, uh, that countries have begin, begun to cut back on in terms of their exports to North Korea and also possibly imports from North Korea that are now uh, banned under UN Security Council resolutions. 
so I think there, there's concern about the fact that, for example, Russia wrote off $10 billion of Soviet-era debt. The United States, in pushing sanctions, um, is obviously trying to inflict pain on North Korea. So this is seen as unhelpful also. Um, so th I think the U.S. ultimately sees Russia as trying to assert itself as a great power in order to, uh, to counter uh, Western power and, and influence, and particularly that of the United States. So that's seen as unhelpful. The relationship between Russia and China was for a long time um, in Washington almost dismissed. You know, people talked about this being a marriage of convenience, right, um, or an axis of uh, convenience. That's changing. Um, there are people who are doing some research now into Russia-China relations, um, uh, I'm sure both inside and outside the government, that see this, uh, this relationship as uh, moving in directions where that our interests in the U.S. may be more negatively affected. The resumption of, the, um, of arms cooperation, some joint development, is probably very high on this list. You know, we went through a period where Russia sold China a lot of arms, then uh, China produced its own versions of this, it copied them, um, and Russia lost some of the, its export markets, and so Russia backed off for a while, and now we've seen this resumed. Um, and so it has a particular uh, concern, I think, to the United States as it contributes to China's ability to have anti-access area denial weapons um, uh, that it can be used against the United States and other countries um, in, a, uh, in a contingency. In the South China Sea, I think actually the U.S. and Russia took fairly similar positions after the July 2016 ruling. Um, Russia called, for example, for compliance with international law, although it didn't call specifically for China uh, to comply, but it underscored UNCLOS and um, called for compliance with the 2002 Declaration on the Code of Conduct and actually called for an early conclusion of a binding code of conduct. And I'll bet that's not Beijing's um, uh, position and probably China doesn't uh, welcome that. So in, in that particular part of the world, I do see some, uh, some overlap, even though Russia and China have conducted a military exercise in the South China Sea, um, though not close really to the disputed area. Um, so then uh, I think turning towards China's involvement in, in Asia, and I'll try to be brief about this because it could be long. Um, <laughs> first, I would say it's really, it's a mixed bag. Uh, and, and the Trump administration's approach on this is evolving. Uh, we've just seen President Trump um, have uh, a wonderful um, day with a uh, day and a half with Xi Jinping celebrating their personal relationship, how much they have in common, all of the goals that they share, you would almost think we're allies. Uh, but we're not. There's a lot of strategic competition in this relationship. And I think what Trump is trying to do is to try to offer some praise and flattery um, to Xi Jinping, uh, uh, not only to him personally, but also to the Chinese people and their accomplishments, and then hope that in the aftermath of this visit that that will set the stage for Xi Jinping to take some steps that Trump wants to see, particularly uh, in North Korea and in the economic realm. The U.S. does see China as playing a very critically important role in North Korea. You will hear time and again U.S. officials saying 90 percent of, uh, of uh, North Korea's trade with the outside world is with China. Um, I have uh, uh, friends in China who dispute that amount and want to see our, our evidence. Um, whatever it is, it's really substantial, even if it's as high as, if it's just as high as 80 percent. Uh, Russia's uh, certainly trading more with North Korea than in the past, but increasingly countries are cutting back on and even stopping trade uh, with North Korea. So this really does, I think, uh, really emphasize that whatever China is continuing to do, and some of China's behavior is in compliance with the UN Security Council resolutions, some of it is not, and that was talked about in uh, Beijing over the last uh, day and a half, and I think Xi Jinping has said uh, that China's cracking down more on banks, for example, that are facilitating North Korean illicit activities as it gains access 
through those banks to the international financial system. So um, uh, China's involvement in North Korea is, you know, it's mixed, right? China should do a lot more, but yet the Trump administration is rightfully giving Xi Jinping China credit for doing more than it's ever done um, in the past, and maybe recognizing at least partially how much of a threat North Korea actually poses. Secretary Tillerson said in his briefing that both of our countries have now endorsed CVID, um, so you know, complete, irreversible, verifiable dismantlement. Um, I, I, if, if so, that might be a new position. Uh, for China, and I have to look into that. But that's the, I, I haven't heard that from the Chinese side, only from Tillerson, so that's always a question mark. Um, a few things on the negative side, and then I will um, uh, stop. One is Chinese efforts to draw a wedge between the United States and its allies, to weaken our allies in the, in the uh, our alliances in the region. This continues. Xi Jinping, even in the work report, called to, uh, talked about Cold War mentality. Um, so this is something, um, obviously, we disagree on. China is still seen <clears throat> Um, as undermining the rules-based order in the South China Sea, pursuing militarization. And uh, Tillerson, again, in his press conference, really emphasized that we want to see this militarization stopped and give diplomacy a real chance in the region. Uh, so this is an area where we see China's involvement as unhelpful. And then finally, um, uh, Yun talked a little bit about the Belt and Road Initiative. And it became apparent when Secretary Tillerson gave his speech here at CSIS the first time we have heard a Trump administration official directly criticize uh, the Belt and Road Initiative, and he explicitly used the term counter uh, the Belt and Road. Um, we have not yet seen re much about what that strategy is going to be to counter the Belt and Road, but I think the U.S. has concerns about some of the low standards um, that will be used in these projects, the quality of the infrastructure that may be produced, uh, the fact that China is likely to be saddling many countries with debt um, and that this, uh, some of this infrastructure building may come with political strings uh, attached. So there are a range uh, of concerns that the U.S. Uh, has, and now there appears to be a growing effort, maybe not only by the U.S., maybe alongside Japan, um, but maybe also as part of the Quad, to provide alternatives uh, to other countries. And uh, so it does seem to me that this administration, compared to the Obama administration, which was very quiet about the Belt and Road Initiative, that this administration really has uh, raised some alarms uh, ab about this strategy going forward, uh, which um, the U.S. and China have talked very little about. And so that may be something going forward where uh, we do need to have more of a uh, discussion. Um, uh, we in the track two world have had U.S., China, Russia uh, uh, trilateral conversations, but um, we haven't done this in the track one world, uh, but I see that as probably um, unlikely in the near future. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Bonnie. Um, appreciated the way that you kind of gave a sense of the direction that things might be shifting. Um, that while U.S. may have common interests that have endured over time in Asia, the way that the current administration is trying to pursue those interests uh, around issues like the Belt and Road may be different um, from how its predecessor did. And so to kick off the discussion, I thought maybe I would raise this issue with all of our panelists, um, and that is all three countries are really facing um, a degree of political questioning or uncertainty um, at home. In, in the U.S., of course, there are a lot of questions about what the ultimate intentions of the Trump administration are, how much political uh, space it will have to do the, the things that um, it, it wants to do and, and what those things are given the divisions within the administration. Um, Russia, of course, has a political transition of its own uh, upcoming with elections scheduled uh, for the spring. And even if those elections result in Vladimir Putin being uh, reelected, uh, I think it raises some questions about how much continuity we can expect in terms of uh, Russian policy and Russian attention to a range of, of topics, including Asia. 
And in China, uh, we just had the Party Congress. We just had um, the elevation of, of Xi Jinping uh, to a exalted status within the, the pantheon of Chinese leaders. Um, but at the same time, concerns are growing about um, debt levels in China, about the sustainability of some of the commitments that are being uh, made under the aegis of the Belt and Road. So I think it's not entirely clear that um, the way that these three countries are going to approach their priorities in Asia in the coming years is going to look the same um, as it has looked for the last several years. And so I thought I would pass over to the panel the question of the extent to which questions about domestic domestic considerations, domestic change, and, and obstacles in each of these countries may have an effect on the way that they engage with Asia uh, in years to come. We can go, yeah, we can go in the same order. Okay, um, if I may comment now a little bit on Russia's view on uh, China and U.S., because sure. I, I, I think I'm the only one who, 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 who did not cover this part. Um, so, uh, as, as I uh, mentioned earlier, that uh, Russia mostly sees Ch Ch China as a, its major strategic partner in Asia, and uh, what Russia does value is that uh, Russia and China have a real uh, have really improved their relations and politics and security, have now more understanding, and are engaged in a, in a dialogue on what could uh, the architecture of East Asia would uh, be in future, and what could be Russia's role in that, China's role in that, and the role of other countries. Uh, what Russia would not uh, be uh, very interested in seeing is a possible China-dominated regional order, uh, because it would not leave any place to Russia uh, as a kind of independent actor with its own stakes, and uh, that's why Russia possibly would not move to a kind of an alliance with China unless the U.S. actions make it so and unless Russia feels that much threatened by the U.S. in Asia that it would need to move to an alliance with China. Uh, and, and, well, and unless the situation worsens that much, we are really unlikely to see that. Um, and. Um, uh, as for the U.S., uh, Russia for sure opposes w what is usually described in Russia as the U.S. Uh, primacy, U.S. preeminence uh, in Asia, and uh, specifically uh, unilateral actions. Uh, and, uh, for example, views thought as a, a kind of a global, uh, a, a part of a global uh, ballistic missile defense, uh, which just has its another regional dimension Russia opposes to in every region. Um, however, uh, there is now almost no cooperation between Russia and U.S. in Asia, and uh, as Bonnie mentioned, the U.S. even doesn't perceive Russia as an Asia, well, as, 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 as a major actor in Asia Pacific. And um, to, uh, if, if we look at Russia and U.S. Uh, relations, possibly East Asia and Asia as a whole is a region where the divergency uh, uh, um, and different interests are less pronounced than in other other regions. Uh, Russia is not entangled in a web of conflicts with the U.S. there, and actually Russia has been very careful uh, not to balance the U.S. in Asia uh, well, up to, up, up, to, up to date, and Russia would be uh, unwilling to do so unless it really feels threatened. Um, and here there is some uh, potential for, well, rather limited but uh, cooperation. Uh, of course, if the relations between countries somehow normal lies in general and somehow are back on track. Uh, but actually, if you look at different regions in Europe, uh, in the um, Eurasia, for example, in post-Soviet space, uh, we can see that in East Asia there is much more potential for uh, common interests that Russia and U.S. share in common uh, and can have at least a, a kind of dialogue, uh, well, even political and security dialogue on uh, a number of issues. Uh, and here, if we could look at possible agenda for Russia-U.S. Uh, dialogue in East Asia, uh, we can see, of course, the station of the Korean Peninsula, where both sides are for denuclearization uh, and North Korean abandonment of new 
nuclear weapons. Russia is 100% for that. Uh, besides that, it is uh, the freedom of navigation. And uh, as Bonnie mentioned, actually Russia uh, has always supported uh, the ASEAN stance uh, in this, that all the disputes should be uh, settled peacefully according to UNCLOS and according to the international law. Uh, and here we can see a lot of convergence. And Russia has been very carefully and has been trying to calibrate its policy so that it, sh that it tries not to take any sides in any territorial conflicts in the East China Sea and the South China Sea as well, uh, and trying to develop relations both with Vietnam, for example, and, and, and with China. However, there is some difference with the US policy, is that Russia objects to involvement of the third parties, because it believes that only the countries which are directly involved should be part of the negotiations on the issue. Um, However, everything is not that bad. And of course, it is also the issues of terrorism, cyber security, uh, security on transport. For example, people returning, ISIS people returning uh, and going to Southeast Asia. Uh, this is where Russia and US could really have a potential uh, to, um, to improve security in the region. Uh, and of course, it is, it is possibly uh, all this uh, number of counter-terrorism measures, non-traditional security threats, uh, and uh, a number of these issues, uh, relief operations. And actually here we can have some substantial dialogue. Of course, if somehow the relations can be at least partly normalized. Uh, and um, for Russia, I think it's very important to say that Russia's pivot could not actually succeed fully unless Russia improves relations with the US and the West. Uh, and uh, to a large extent, the success of Russia's pivot lies within the US. And, um, uh, and uh, Russia and US can um, either contribute somehow or maybe not prevent each other's strategic courses or uh, oppose and make uh, each other policy harder. And of course, here the influence of the US on Russia's Asian policy would be much uh, stronger than vice versa. Uh, but possibly this could still be a ground for uh, their uh, cooperation. Um, if we look at uh, Russia's internal politics, um, the major question is if we see Vladimir Putin uh, as a candidate as a presidential candidate for spring elections next time, because it has not been confirmed yet. Uh, and um, we um, do not really know if it's not he who else would run for the president. And I guess this is the central question. Uh, of course, if uh, President Putin runs for the elections, he is very likely to win the elections because there is a, um, a popular support. Uh, and here, I think we would have a lot of continuity on this issue. Um, and um, I actually do not see, uh, well, um, for example, any Mm, um, mm, uh, real shift uh, of Russia's policy, for example, away from Asia. Um, and what, what I think will also be a priority for Russia is development of the Eurasian Economic Union. Uh, and uh, possibly uh, what President Putin has been promoting, uh, building a great Eurasian partnership, uh, which means connecting the Eurasian Economic Union, Russia's own integration project, with the Belt and Road Initiative, and finding some modes of cooperation that could be beneficial for everyone. Everyone. And, and, and it's true that uh, um, Yunsun already mentions that we have no yet concrete projects on connecting the Eurasian Economic Union and Belt and Road. However, just this October, uh, there has been agreed, uh, um, uh, the, there is an agreement reached between the Eurasian Economic Union and China. Uh, on the general principles of economic cooperation, possibly measures on trade facilitation, not in FTA yet, but some kind of economic agreement. Possibly we would see something in future if Vladimir Putin is next president. Thank you. Um, I'll be quick. So when I hear the, 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 the term that has political uncertainty in China, my question is, what political uncertainty <laughs> after so there was the uncertainty is how many years is Xi Jinping going to be yes, in power? There is uncertainty. <laughs> so there were more speculation and uncertainty before the 19th Party's Congress, but now I think that the debate about that is more or less settled. Um, but I think the uncertainty is more about 
now that we know that Xi Jinping has consolidated his power, what policy course will he pursue in terms of foreign policy? And there are two paradigms that we can uh, we can we can we can try to deconstruct this issue. First paradigm is if we look at how China reacted to um, when Obama first came in. Um, Came, um, Obama first became the, uh, the president of the United States. U.S. also reached out to China with a list of issues like AFPAC, like North Korea, like climate change. The U.S. was trying to pursue cooperation with China. But that unfortunately created a sense of, um, I call it an inflated sense of empowerment in China. That the, the conclusion back then in 2009, I was based in Beijing, in China was that, oh, U.S. is weakened, U.S. is weak, that finally our time has come. So that did not end up well and, um, between U.S. and China because U.S. had to respond to this rising assertiveness of China. But if we look at how China has reacted to, to the first year of the Trump administration, I think the Chinese has learned the lesson from the Obama years that, um, that when U.S. wants to pursue cooperation with China, China should not interpret that as a, as a sign of weakness. So from that perspective, we could, we could speculate that um, China is likely to pursue more cooperative tone with the Trump administration. Second paradigm is, um, is, a, is, a, is a discussion I often have with, uh, with the Chinese scholars and experts. My question to them is that, so when you say that Chinese leader is weak, China has to be more assertive in terms of its Asia policy. So does that mean that when Chinese leader is strong, he will adopt a less assertive policy? And the answer is uh, not necessarily that when we are strong, we, we deserve our space, we deserve the respect. But when we are, re when we are weak, we also need, need foreign policy to support the, the domestic prestige of the leaders. So based on that, I think that the, then the, the inevitable answer is that China's Asia policy will be certain and that China will proceed with a path of seeking more influence and more dominance in the Asia region. Um, I think the real, the real uncertainty here that people often talk about is the economic uncertainty, that if the Chinese economic slowdown is going to continue, can China, does China have the capacity, the financial capacity to sustain its, uh, its, this economic statecraft or this economic diplomacy? Um, I, and there have been reports in China about how this, uh, this regulations for against capital fleeing, capital escape from China, affecting uh, certain in infrastructure projects that China tries to fund. But I would like to point out that for the core, or the critical projects under the Belt and Road Initiative, the, um, the funding or the financing for these projects had not been affected tremendously by this, uh, by this economic slowdown. So I'll stop there. Uh, I'll be very brief. Um, I, I think the first point I'd like to make is that despite the domestic um, challenges um, and uh, the things going on in domestic politics here in the United States, uh, Trump did embark on a very long trip to Asia. A trip could have been canceled, could have been shortened, instead it was lengthened. The president decided to stay the extra day for the East Asia summit. So this is the longest trip to Asia I think that a president has made in 25 years and the fact that he's going um, uh, to you know six different um, uh, countries I, I think is really remarkable, or six stops, right? Uh, so, uh, I don't see that domestic troubles are going to keep the president at home, distract attention um, from Asia. Many people asked, well, Xi Jinping is in such a strong position having emerged from the 19th Party Congress and Trump's polls are at all-time lows. Does that give you know, the uh, China an advantage, put the U.S. at a disadvantage? Is that somehow going to affect the U.S. approach? And you know, my answer to that is the president doesn't see it that way. Uh, you know, Trump sees himself as in a very strong position. <laughs> And he doesn't uh, really pay that much attention to what one particular poll says on a given ba base, given day. Um, and if you're spending most of your time watching things like Fox News, you'll probably hear ver a lot of positive reinforcement. So um, I, I don't think that he's going to change his personal views. And then the last point that I make, which I think is sort of worth 
at least pondering, is people will ask the question, would Trump be more likely to launch an attack on North Korea if he's in a very weak position at home, thinking that that could boost support for him? And this is you know, an ongoing debate that goes on even in academic literature about a diversionary war. Uh, and there is, really isn't persuasive or conclusive uh, data that shows that countries do this, that leaders do this, um, uh, or that it works for leaders if, in fact, uh, some have done this. And, and, and so I, I guess I would say that you know, Trump has been pushing for a tougher policy toward uh, North Korea for a long time, you know, since he really first came to power. Uh, because he had had this conversation with President Obama during the transition. Um, so it has nothing to do with his, the drop in his polling rati ratings or um, uh, suspicions about his family members uh, you know, being corrupt or doing business with Russia. They pre-existed it. Um, so I, I guess I think that this is quite unlikely. I think that uh, there will not be a domestic element that will drive President Trump to do something in North Korea that he would not otherwise do, so I would eliminate that factor. Thank you. Okay, we have um, well, a little bit less than half an hour, so I wanna open the floor up for questions. Since we don't have a ton of time, I'd encourage you to keep your questions short, and please, please, please make sure that they are, in fact, questions. Uh, that is a statement that ends in a question mark. Um, also, please identify yourself. We have microphones in the back. Uh, so, okay, yeah, right there. Hi, uh, Jeff Hatch, uh, Department of Defense. Uh, I had a question for Anna. I was, uh, I, I know you mentioned North Korea and uh, you know uh, Russia's uh, government thoughts towards that. Uh, I was wondering if you could expand a little bit more on that and talk about whether or not there would be any uh, scenario uh, whereby the Russian government would would. Uh, become more involved uh, in the Korean Peninsula, North Korea. Uh, and also, if you could talk a little bit, or phrase it as a question, uh, how, how do you think the, uh, the Russian academic, uh, Russian public feels about uh, the border with Korea that Russia shares? Uh, not just, you know, what does the government think, but if you could shed some light on that for this, uh, mostly American audience, that'd be great. Thank you, I'll try to be br as much brief as possible. Um, if we look at what Russia thinks on North Korea, um, what is the basics of Russia's position that there should be no military actions, simply because we share a border with North Korea, 70 kilometers border, and uh, if any military action are to be taken, uh, of course, Russia would not suffer that much as China will, but still it, it, it has a stake, and uh, there could be a probable damage to the civilian population, contamination of the Far East, and uh, of course, in case of nuclear actions, Russian Far East will suffer too. Uh, that's why Russia has been uh, promoting the political dialogue and has been um, trying to reach out to other countries as a mediator and has uh, also um, envisioned a roadmap for um, some um, um, a, a roadmap for the resolution of the issue of the North Korean Peninsula. The first stage, dual freeze, supporting China's proposal. Second stage, negotiations, both bilateral, like US, North Korea, South Korea, North Korea, and then negotiations, multilateral, on how on, on what will be on the table for the six-party talks, or maybe six-party talks plus the UN, or probably some other uh, mediators, like ASEAN, or uh, uh, just, well, most probably the UN, and what could be uh, the, um, uh, how could parties conduct uh, um, relations with each other, um, and what could be the issue of, of the talks, with a view, large, uh, a long a strategic view to the denuclearization of North Korea, for sure. Uh, and the third uh, thing is uh, building a kind of a security architecture, talks on building collective security act architecture, meaning that North Korea should be provided something uh, in return for abandoning nuclear weapons, should be provided some security guarantees, uh, and especially from the US, because this is what North Korea actually wants. Um, the, the, the main goal is uh, uh, to 
for the regime to, to, to be sustained. And, um, and uh, if you look at economic relations, what I would like to stress uh, is that actually economic relations between Russia and North Korea are extremely small. The exact figure of the trade last year was uh, $76 million. And this could not, be, could not be in any way compared with China's trade with North Korea. Uh, and actually, uh, this figure even uh, grew, um, even declined uh, if we compare to 2014 when it was 96 million. But I mean, it's not a substantial figure we could actually talk about. And Russia has not been sponsoring North Korea for sure. Uh, and 100% um, Russia has been adhering to all the sanctions and is going to do this. And a matter of concern is the North Koreans, uh, 32,000, which are in the Far East. And uh, the last sanctions say that their labor visa, when it is over, uh, they should return to North Korea. It cannot be resumed. And Russia will also adhe adhere to that for sure. Um, so. Um, um, and I, I don't really think that Russia would like to be involved in any military hostilities. What it would like to be involved is some political, any political and diplomatic solution. And it really wants to be, uh, to serve as a mediator here. Um, the, the population are very concerned, especially in the Far East, about any uh, uh, possible military actions on the peninsula. And here I should say that Ru Russian experts and population blame both North Korea and the US for all the tensions. They, they do not lay the blame only on the North Korean side. They, th they say mostly that North Korea has also its own, um, well, some um, reasoning that it's not irrational, it is very rational. It wants the survival of the regime uh, and it felt threatened. Uh, and uh, so um, it also blames, puts a lot of blame on North Korea, but not only on, 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 on North Korea, and thinks that uh, um, any, well, military action should be avoided at any coast. Uh, but, but Russia would not send troops or anything like that. This is highly unlikely. Okay, thank you. Um, over here. Hi, Lauren Holt, Holt Global Strategies, formerly with State Department. My question is about the illegal, illicit trade, black markets. How do we deal with that? That's been going on, and sanctions are certainly not our only answer. Thank you. With North Korea, sorry. Okay. Is it a question for anybody in particular? Or for I, I would say, um, at least one thing that could be done would be to enhance inspections. I mean, if you look at the border crossings between China and uh, uh, and North Korea, there's uh, we know where most of the uh, of the goods cross. Um, we probably know where most of the smuggling takes place. We could have um, m far more strict uh, inspections. We could even put a UN official <laughs> on a bridge <laughs> um, to, uh, to work with China in these uh, inspections. Uh, I don't know if that's been discussed. Uh, but um, there are certainly ways to try and increase border security, uh, whether it's along the Russian border or the Chinese border. Um, and it, we could perhaps, I mean, I don't know if uh, China has sufficient equipment. They have a lot of people. Um, <laughs> there's about 150,000 even just PLA troops in the area, um, not along the border, but um, uh, people's armed police that are up there. Uh, so there's, uh, but you know, question is, do they have all the right kind of uh, capabilities in terms of equipment to monitor um, the border? That's an area where the U.S. could be of help. I'll just add, I think it's more of an issue of political will rather than the material capacity that um, I, I, I believe that um, if the Chinese government has a, has a willingness to strictly and 100% implement the sanctions, they definitely have the capacity. But whether they see it as in their interest or whether they see it as... Um, as, uh, as, as necessary at this point or needed, that's a political question, it's not a capacity question. And for us, as far as it could be a capacity question. <laughs> okay. 
I think it's also a political question for Russia to some degree. Um, that North Korea plays a, a similar role for Russia as it does for China in the sense that it's a problem, but it's also something that is a source of leverage with the United States and that Russia is willing to use in a, a kind of calculated way as it, as it sees necessary. Um, okay, I saw here. Yeah. Hi, I'm Sana Vonavort. I'm with the Osgood Center for International Studies. Um, most of you discuss the role of India and India as a strategic partner for all of your countries. I was wondering if you have any idea of what the positions of India are with regards to their willingness to partner with any of your countries and how you think that what their role is in kind of becoming a strategic partner to any of your countries. Okay, let's be brief. I would just note that there's obviously growing willingness in, in India to work with uh, the United States, to work with Japan, um, to some extent with Australia. Uh, but Modi has talked a lot about, um, you know, act east, and I still see limited very really concrete measures in acting east. You know, I know when I go to the Shangri-La dialogue, there usually is not high level of participation by India. It is the East Asia summit. Um, uh, so India is not, I think, as much of a player um, as uh, Prime Minister Modi uh, aspires it to be. Uh, but there is a desire by, I think, the United States and Japan to have India play a bigger role um, in East Asia. Uh, but I think India's priorities have, have been more, for example, um, in the Indian Ocean, uh, maritime areas, um, obviously, as concerns um, along its border uh, with, with China. So I think it's still a question mark as to how committed India will be in the future, um, whether it's to, you know, its own unilateral um, involvement in the region or cooperating with uh, other countries. We, we see the desire, we see the interest, um, and I see a trend in that direction, but it does seem rather slow to me. I think China's interest or enthusiasm about this uh, partnership with India is certainly more uh, significant than India's interest in this partnership. And at least on the bilateral level, we could see that India's um, uh, rejection of China's Belt and Road Initiative. China, uh, India did not participate in the BARF in Beijing, <laughs> the Belt and the Road Forum this, uh, this past May. And the Chinese perception of the partnership with India exists on a global level between India and China as developing countries vis-a-vis -vis the developed countries. But on the regional level, what China sees more is a need to balance India's tendency to exclude China and India's aspiration to, to dominate the South Asia region. So China recognizes that India is the largest country in the in the South Asia subcontinent, but it does not mean that China ceases to India's exclusivity. So I think there are more um, conflict of perceptions or misperceptions between India and China in terms of this partnership. And China also has this fundamental, I call it strategic contempt towards India, because China essentially sees India as, as a backward and ineffective and inefficient country. And China also has this tendency, at least for the strategic thinkers in China, since the war of 1962 has permanently settled the dispute or the competition for leadership or dominance between China and India, that India is not China's peer and will never be China's peer. So we, we take that into consideration and think about this strong desire on China's part to pursue this partnership with India. I almost feel, well, I call it an imaginary coalition with India. Um, as for Russia and India, I think there is a, a large degree of convergence because, uh, especially on foreign policy goals, because India sees itself as a kind of global power, and Russia uh, and India share this perception of a polycentric world order, and Russia leaves a place for India as an emerging power in this polycentric world order, and actually thinks that Russia-India partnership could be one of its constructive pillars. So I, th I see there a great degree of convergence. Uh, and we we uh, 
actually ha are engaged in a, in a very robust security cooperation with India, although uh, Russia's share of Indian military market is uh, decreasing, uh, but it is still a large share. And in contrast with China, we sh uh, even there is a high degree of trust uh, in building um, joint military equipment together, something which we don't have, for example, with, with China. Uh, and uh, there, ha there have been a lot of um, security cooperation here. What has been lacking, uh, again, as for Russia everywhere is the economic dimension, because our trade is so much lagging behind uh, the, the, the politics and security. I could imagine that last year we had a trade turnover of $7.7 .7 billion, which is not a sufficient figure at all in any way. And there is an understanding that it should be strengthened, but uh, the, it's difficult even from the geographical terms, uh, and not speaking about all other economic issues. Uh, Steve Winters, uh, independent consultant. Uh, this is for Anna also. I, I, I wonder if you felt that the recent meeting of the Valdai discussion group reflected the uh, turn to the east or pivot to the east. I was struck that at the uh, big public session that on the podium, aside from uh, uh, the President Putin, you had Jack Ma from Alibaba who gave an absolute major address. Then you had Ahmed Karzai, ex-president of Afghanistan, and then from the audience, then you had Gregory Tolaraya uh, ask a question about North Korea, which, which seemed to me a little bit stage managed since he's one of the main people advising on the policy of North Korea. If he doesn't know what Putin is thinking about North Korea, I don't know what that was about. But did, did you feel there was sort of a change there from previous years? Uh, thank you. Yes, I, I think that there has been a focus, uh, uh, well, there has emerged a governmental focus on relations with Asia, which was absent uh, before the, uh, the crisis, the Ukrainian crisis. And this is kind of a positive development for Russia's East Asian policy, because although we had this uh, well, strategic perspective that we need to strengthen our policies, not much was done in practice. And now, yes, I think, yes, and especially if we look at uh, the new prospects of relations between Putin and Abe, Russia and Japan, and Putin and Moon Jae-in in South Korea. Uh, there is a lot going on uh, here in politics and security, especially in economics. And yes, I, I, I think that uh, even the Eastern Economic Forum demonstrates that uh, th uh, these countries, they see potential in Russia, and that uh, Russia could possibly gradually uh, improve its, its, its standings. And, and I think, yes, uh, of course, uh, probably the major dimension is still like Eurasia now uh, of, of President Putin and this agenda. Uh, but I think that a Asia has gained prominence uh, if we compare to previous situations. Um, Jonathan Ward, University of Oxford. Anna, I have a question for you. Um, you said that Russia does not want to see a China-dominated Asian order, which I thought was very interesting. I'm curious about um, two things. One, what role do you think Russia's current activities are playing in, the, in bringing about something that's getting closer to a China-dominated Asian order, particularly as Bonnie mentioned, the proliferation of A2AD technology? So, Anti-access area to know. And part two, um, when Russian um, strategists, you know, when you're discussing the sort of Russia's strategic vision, look at the future of Russia's Far East, not in the near term, but let's say over the next 25 years, particularly if something as envisioned in the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation were to be achieved, where do you see um, Russia's position in Asia being in, in that sort of longer term perspective, particularly in the Far East? Russian positions where? In East Asia, the future of mm -hmm. Rus Russia's Far East over a 25 year ah, period. Okay. Um, thank you. It, it's very difficult uh, to answer the questions briefly. I'll try to do my best. Um, so, if we look at Russia, China, uh, um, Russia selling new sophisticated weapons to China, um, S 400, for example, uh, anti ballistic missile defense systems, I, I think you're mostly implying to, and, um, air, uh, and um, air, um, 
air, aircraft. Uh, yeah, with the anti-aircraft and yeah, anti-ship. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, I think that we, uh, we can see here, um, well, as actually Bonnie mentioned, uh, there used to be uh, um, a, a, a downslide in, in, in Russia-China security cooperation, especially military cooperation, because Russia was too much concerned with what China um, uh, taking samples and copying Russian um, military equipment. Uh, however, as far, uh, as far as contemporary stage is concerned, Russia probably decided that China has been very quick to develop its own military capabilities, and then uh, Russia, uh, Russia's share in, in Chinese market has declined a lot, and that if uh, it is to get any money for its own military development and stimulating research and development, for example, uh, it now may sell some, um, well, um, more sophisticated weapons to China, uh, because simply like in 10 or 15 years, China would acquire this capability anyway, and Russia would not have enough funds uh, for um, uh, investing its own uh, military Capabilities, so it kind of decided to use this moment, and especially possibly with within this rift with the U.S., uh, when it sees U.S. actions as mostly threatening stability, or, well, and also um, its uh, own positions uh, in the world in general, including Asia and ballistic missile defense in Asia. Possibly we, we could find the answer here. Um, how, however, it's not the, the top level. Russia has, al has already produced something that it, 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 that, uh, uh, S-400, S for example. Uh, the, 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 uh, and the top level is still in Russia for itself. And Russia has also um, contracts with India, for example. India will be the second country Country, which would get S-400. Um, uh, so this is this is very quickly for for, for, for our military planning. Uh, this is very difficult to say if our military planning really does want China to get better um, uh, A2AD capability, possibly its actions are now motivated mostly by the negative uh, attitude towards the U.S. and the, uh, the U.S. military actions. As specifically, our military, I think, is more into that and more into military security cooperation with China. Uh, in 25 years, Russia's Far East is to be developed with Asian partners, for sure. Russia doesn't have resources to develop it alone. Uh, there is insufficient labor, uh, very small market, and uh, Russia does not not have simply got money to invest in the Far East. That's why it's trying to devise a new model, which would be like economic zones everywhere in East Asia. And possibly we would like to see not only ch a lot of Chinese companies in the Far East, but a lot of companies of other countries, like Japan and South Korea in the first place, also ASEAN, India, and maybe even the US, uh, and well, European partners, of course. So that uh, all different partners could have a stake there. It would be a better developed region, and Russia could bring its also economic stake to East Asia and try to, to somehow improve the stability of the region by having its better presence. Well, I, th I think that's mostly Russia's vision. Either it realizes or not is, is another question. Okay, we're getting close to the end. So if there are a couple of questions, let me t take uh, two or three now and then we will wrap up. So I see two right here on the aisle three right here on the aisle. Let's just do them sequentially, and then we'll pass it back to the panelists. Um, I'm Yoroske Kimolar from Sasaka Peace Foundation, <coughs> USA. So uh, I would like to uh, ask Anne and you uh, about policy towards Japan. And because all of you mentioned about something like sometimes it's Japan, but uh, there is a US-Japan, a strong US-Japan alliance maybe. So, um, in what areas can Russia and China cooperate with Japan? Okay, um, so I think we can only take two questions because Bonnie has to run, so we'll do this one. Uh, Russia and China relations with Japan and then the gentleman sitting in front of you. Hi, uh, Charles Pritchard from the Asian Development Bank. Uh, my question is on the recent MOU that was signed between uh, OPIC and two Japanese um, investment banks um, as kind of the first uh, obvious U.S. counter or balance against um, the, the BRI. I just wanted to ask, what do you see 
Are the, uh, what, do you, well, what are the implications on U.S.-China relations directly resulting from that? Okay, great. So why don't we just go down the road again? Anna, if you want to start. Um, on, this, on the second question, um, I think th it's that it will be interesting to watch. Uh, China will be concerned about whether the United States is really going to mount a very, you know, forceful, you know, whole of government strategy. I mean, where are we going to get the resources from? Uh, so th what you cited is this OPEC agreement, is, is, is that really going to be the substance of the strategy? Is there going to be much more to follow? I'm pretty certain that our, the U.S. Congress is not going to be voting resources for, a, you know, infrastructure development in, in, in Asia. So we have to work with partners. Um, and I don't know how much resources there's going to be. So um, I think, you know, this is just, it's, it's a question in my mind as well. And, and I doubt that there will be any impact on U.S.-China relations in the near term. Uh, the Chinese are going to be suspicious, concerned, worried. Um, but at the same time, there's a level of confidence in China about how much they've already achieved, how many countries have signed up to participate in the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, how welcome they are in providing uh, many of these um, loans and you know infrastructure projects. They've gotten a four-plus-year head start, right? And so my guess is they're not going to be terribly concerned about it. If it begins to look like an anti-China containment strategy, it will have a negative impact on the U.S.-China relationship. On the second issue, I agree with uh, I agree with Bonnie. I don't think the Chinese would be particularly concerned about one or two specific individual projects signed that seems to counter BRI, but otherwise, without BRI, it probably would still happen. Um, on the issue of Japan, I'm personally pessimistic about um, about the future of China-Japan relations and under Prime Minister Abe. And it seems there's this this uh, this decision made in China that as long as Abe remains to be the Prime Minister, we, we cannot carry the risk of trying to reach out and then he does something the second day and makes us look bad. Uh, that seems to be the prevailing sense that um, that and it's going to be not so good. And But one issue that I know the Chinese are talking about, about how Japan can improve that relationship, is that well, Japan can join AIB. <laughs> and that's uh, another discussion. About Russia and Japan, I'm very optimistic about Russia and Japan. Um, and I think there is now kind of a new momentum. The countries are trying to uh, look if they can build up something more than they could build uh, previously. And there is also a strategic dimension here. Uh, Japan uh, wanting to prevent uh, Ra uh, Russia-China well, alliance or probably anti-Japan actions from happening. And Russia also trying to diversify its partners to make its Asian pivot more balanced. And of course, Russia is in need of Japanese investment, technologies, innovations. This is where Japan and South Korea come in much more handy than uh, most other states in Asia, including China. Uh, and uh, here is really a great potential. Uh, but this current rapprochement is very fragile, for sure. Um, and um, possibly, if it is rather successful, we could uh, see it as a constructive factor uh, and contributing to Russia's strength and position and Japan's strength and position, their re relative foreign policy autonomy as well, which could not be that bad for Asia. Uh, but um, there is a fixation uh, on territorial issue and how it can be settled. And there is a symmetry of expectations how the relations could develop and if this issue can be settled by Russia and uh, Japan, while Russia wants uh, for some different uh, climate of relations, for some different atmosphere, and to build up this atmosphere, it will take uh, a long time. It's not like one or two years. And ABBA is trying to push a lot um, for uh, the resolution of the territorial issue. Uh, and uh, probably now the, uh, we could have some better economic cooperation. Uh, uh, in these two years, we have signed 100, more than 150 agreements, actually. Mostly they are MOUs. And it is to be seen if they are to realized. Russia should do its homework better on improving investment climate. But still, it's a great sign. We have, we, it's the unprecedented level we are seeing now. So this is very quickly. Uh, 
Okay, and with that, I think we need to wrap it up. Thank you all for coming. Let's give a round of applause for our panelists.